morning, CQA judges. We are the Trojans USC team, and we are fourth year undergraduate students at the University of Southern California in our undergraduate student investment fund class. In that class, we manage a $3 million endowment crossing two portfolios. My name is Salman Javed, and joining me today is Andrew Billings, Brian Wang, Ryan McCarthy, and Stanley Sue. And through the process of preparing and reporting our data, we enlisted the help of our professors, Dr. Su Ping Ku and, and Scott Abrams, as well as the help of Dr. Jia Yi of First Quadrant. Our philosophy and approach is superior, in our opinion, because it is fundamentally supported by academic research, is simply repeatable and implementable, and returns consistently across market conditions and time. The research we base our philosophy on produced three main parameters for our portfolio screen. Low beta, value, and momentum. When it came to executing the methodology, the repeatability of our process enabled us to run dozens of backtests against US, Japan, and United Kingdom markets from 2000 to 2015. Moreover, it outperformed the benchmark for majority of our data's testing period. Below is a brief overview of our performance metrics and CQA challenge rankings. We generated a sharp ratio, or risk-adjusted return, of 3.57, which was first in the challenge. We generated an excess mean return of 45.91%, which was sixth in the challenge. And finally, our standard deviation was 12.87%. Today, we will cover our approach and results for the challenge in the following chronology. First, we'll talk about how we utilized an academically supported framework for identifying the investment factors. This established the parameters for our research. We'll then cover the deep dive we took into three of the most salient factors, low beta, value, and momentum. Third, we will briefly explain how we constructed the portfolio through a screening methodology. Then, we'll go over the backtesting of our portfolio returns that we performed to analyze its significance and resilience. And finally, we'll give an overview of portfolio's performance, as well as a report on how and where we attribute those returns. And then we'll conclude with closing remarks. So now I'll briefly discuss the basic concept of factor investing, and more specifically, talk about the framework for which we chose our factors to optimize our portfolio. So exactly is factor investing? A factor can be defined as any characteristic relating to a group of securities that explains their risk and returns. To determine which of these factors work well together to outperform, and constructing a portfolio with these factors is what we call factor investing strategy. And so we adopted Research Affiliates Factor Isolation Framework to determine the optimal factors for our CQA portfolio. First, the framework defines a robust factor as one whose economic foundation and persistence have been debated and validated by academic research. Second, the effect should persist across time periods and be statistically significant in most countries. Third, the effect should survive reasonable variations in the definition of the factor strategy. So the first criteria is deep literature debating and vetting the factor. We look for factors that, we, that were debated and discussed to such an extent that we cannot credit the premium returns to either coding errors or one very particular definition of the factor. It was very important that the factor premium could be replicated by other researchers. For example, Fama French's breakthrough research on value has been cited over 14,000 times. The second criteria is persistence across time and geographies. When a factor that provides a positive premium in the United States does not earn a positive premium in other global markets, the factor is likely an artifact of the US data rather than a reliable source of excess return. Our last criteria is variety in definition. For example, the standard definition of the value characteristic is the book to market ratio. However, the PE ratio would be an equally reasonable definition as well. If factor portfolios based off of these two definitions of the value factor had contradictory results, the value anomaly wouldn't be persistent and may be a result of data mining. Ultimately, these, this research framework eliminates the biases involved in our research, which will allow us to identify truly robust factors. Through our factor isolation research, we determined our three robust factors to be low beta, value, and momentum. The low correlation among these three factors and their high positive expected returns implies that a simple combination of the three will generate even greater excess returns. To build upon the framework that Stanley discussed, I will go in depth regarding the academic research behind our three factors, low beta, value, and momentum. Afterwards, I will show our methodology for forming the three-factor portfolio. For our low beta factor, the market currently believes more risk equals higher returns. 
we had an investment philosophy that without leverage, investors overweight risky stocks in order to achieve excess returns. Frazzini supported this belief in his academic paper, Betting Against Beta. In addition, institutional investors are evaluated relative to their benchmark tracking error, which discourages investment in low-risk stocks. We implemented this philosophy into our investment strategy by buying stocks with a beta in the bottom 50 percentile and shorting stocks with a beta in the top 50 percentile. This table provides empirical evidence that from 1963 to 2008, low beta stocks generated superior returns. As you can see, stocks in the lowest quintile of beta provided an average excess return of 1.5% annually, while stocks in the highest quintile returned on average 2.5% less annually. For our value factor, the current market belief is that investors are risk averse. Our investment philosophy stems from the idea that high booked market firms tend to be financially distressed and therefore investors will require additional return to justify taking on excess risk. Also, value stocks tend to be overlooked and are less followed by investment analysts. This belief is reinforced by Joseph Petrosky in his academic paper, Value Investing, the use of historical financial statement information to separate winners from losers. We executed this factor by buying value stocks and shorting growth stocks. This is supported by the cross-section of expected stock returns written by Eugene Fama and Kenneth French. As you can see here, value outperforms growth indices in addition to the overall market over time. According to Fama and French, value outperforms the market by 5% on an annualized basis. For our momentum factor, the market currently believes in the old adage of buying low and selling high. Our investment philosophy was that stocks that are strongly going up in the past will continue to experience share price appreciation in the near future, and vice versa. This philosophy is backed by Jagadish and Tipman, as the six-month trailing momentum strategy realizes a compounded excess return of 9.5% per year on average. In addition, we incorporated technical analysis that supported momentum by head researchers at the University of Colorado Denver and Washington University St. Louis. We executed this factor by buying upward trending positive momentum stocks and shorting downward trending negative momentum stocks. With our academically supported factors determined, we use the S&P Capital IQ Screener as a tool to form our three-factor portfolio. To start, we narrowed our investment universe of the Russell 1000. Next, we applied our three isolated factors, low beta, value, and momentum. To execute our low beta factor, we bought stocks in the bottom 50 percentile and shorted those in the top 50 percentile while using a five-year beta with the assumption that the risk of a company's operations remains consistent. After, we applied the value factor by buying stocks with a price to earnings less than 20 and EV to EBITDA less than 15. Our threshold was based on historical averages of the index and include a margin of safety within two standard deviations. We shorted stocks with a price to earnings greater than 20 and EV to EBITDA greater than 15. Lastly, for the momentum factor, we bought stocks with positive 11 month momentum, meaning positive price change over 12 months minus the most recent month. Due to academic support of one month reversals, the most recent month is excluded. The same concept was applied to five month momentum. In addition, we included a technical indicator of momentum the crossing of the 50-day moving average above the 200-day moving average, also known as the Golden Cross. Conversely, we shorted stocks with negative 11-month momentum, 5-month momentum, and ones where the 50-day moving average crossed below the 200-day moving average, also known as the Death Cross. Now that we had a simple and repeatable process assisted by S&P Capital IQ to form portfolios, the next step was to test to see if our strategy would work. To do so, we applied our methodology to three different markets, the United States, Japan, and the United Kingdom, in order to show consistent outperformance in each market across time. 
In the United States, we applied our methodology to the Russell 1000 as our investment universe and tested returns over 14 years. The result was outperformance in 8 of the 14 years and an average excess return of 4.47% over the Russell 1000. If we had implemented our strategy in the year 2000 and assumed annual rebalancing, we would have generated a total return of 101% by 2013. And we see similar results in Japan. We applied the same methodology to the Tokyo Price Index as our investment universe and tested the returns over 10 years. The result was outperformance in 6 of the 10 years and an average return of 1.53% over the benchmark. If we had implemented that strategy in 2005 and assumed annual rebalancing, we would have generated a total return of 81% by 2014. And lastly, the UK is by far the brightest market of them all. We applied our methodology to the FTSE All Share Index and tested the returns over 15 years. The result was outperformance in 12 of the 15 years with an average excess return of 12.98% over the benchmark. But if we had implemented that strategy in 2000 and assumed annual rebalancing, we would have generated a total return of 576% by 2014. The main takeaway of our backtesting is that our strategy is robust and generates consistent outperformance across time and geography. Next, I will provide an overview of our portfolio's performance from execution on October 30th, 2015 through February 12th, 2016. I will start with an overview of our long and short portfolio performance and then dive more deeply into the driving forces behind our returns. As you can see, our portfolio generated 15.2% return relative to the S&P 500's 9.71% loss in the same three and a half month period. Most of our return was attributable to success in our short portfolio, which I'll discuss more later. Our performance equates to an annualized excess return of 45.91% based on a geometric mean of our daily return. We take pride in achieving a sharp ratio of 3.57, the highest in the competition. We attribute this success not only to our high raw return, but also to our focus on low beta. This allowed us to generate strong returns with low volatility, making our portfolio the top investment option in the competition on a risk-adjusted basis. Diving more deeply into our portfolio, we can see that our top holdings were dominated by shorts while our bottom holdings were typically long positions, which we attribute to the recent struggles in the market. Regardless, the huge positive return of our top positions more than made up for the negative returns in the struggling positions of our portfolio. We had great performance in both our long and short portfolios. Not a single one of our shorts lost money, with our worst performing short positions still generating 1.76% of positive return. Interestingly, our fifth worst short actually outperformed our fifth best long, Again, we attribute these poor returns in our long portfolio to the broader market struggling, as well as an identification of strong short opportunities with our methodology. Finally, we analyzed our performance in relation to the three pillars of our strategy. To start, we created a blended benchmark which combined ETFs to represent longs and shorts in our three factors. We then calculated the sharp ratios of this benchmark, as well as each factor on its own. As you can see, our portfolio outperformed each of these factors. Finally, we ran a regression of our portfolio against the blended benchmark to determine what was driving our results. As seen in the table on the right, our value and low beta factors were statistically significant in explaining our returns. We found it interesting to see that momentum did not significantly contribute to our returns, and we would like to investigate this further in the future with more data. We are proud of our strong returns, especially on a risk-adjusted basis. We believe that our academically supported, repeatable, and consistent approach provides a means of exceptional performance into the future. As we've heard throughout our presentation, our approach is truly unique, and we believe it to be advantageous in its honing of three redeeming qualities, academically supported, repeatable, and consistent. Each of our isolated factors, low beta, value, and momentum, are steeped in deep academic research from some of the most brilliant minds in theoretical finance. As seen by our methodology, our execution was simple and easily replicable. As seen by our backtesting, our returns were consistent across time and geography. And to reiterate our performance for your convenience, we've listed our annualized returns and respective rankings. So on behalf of the Trojans USC team, we'd like to thank you for viewing our presentation. 
We hope we've been able to provide a fresh and interesting perspective to the CQA challenge. Thank you again and have a good day.